Good evening, everyone. My name is Valerie Habeff, and I'm honored to welcome you all on behalf of Jewish Democratic Women's Salon Atlanta. Georgia may be well known for its grits, but tonight you're going to get to meet three women who actually have grit. This evening, we will be joined by Georgia State Senator Jen Jordan, Georgia State Representative Shay Roberts, and Georgia State Representative Jasmine Clark. It's been a much debated question. How did Georgia flip? Each of these three women did what was formerly improbable. They flipped a Georgia district from red to blue. The last election cycle demonstrated the power of women coming together to create change. Black women, Pan-Asian women, Latin American women, white suburban women, and Jewish women too. Collectively, we are mighty. We've started something big, and now we need more women to understand what it takes to run for elected office at every level and what it takes to flip a district blue. Some of you may remember a time when we were young and our parents used to tell us to not sit too close to the TV. Well, tonight we invite you to sit close and learn. These three women trusted themselves to do what others said couldn't be done. Each of them exercised their political clout and flipped a district, but they didn't do it alone. Each of them was win list endorsed for their campaigns. Our discussion tonight will be hosted by Melita Easters, the founder and chief executor of Georgia's win list, Women in Numbers. Melita's vision was to create a way to empower Georgia's women with the political acumen, not just to run, but to win. Here's a clue to the insight Melita had in 1999. It takes women in numbers. Since its beginning, Georgia Winlist has trained more than 2,100 women with their leadership training programs. More than 15 graduates of the year-long program hold elected office and dozens more have attended one-day training programs and gone on to win office. Many have said that, that the secret to our statewide democratic victories depends on the power of relational voting, one person inspiring another to register and to vote. But winning takes more than just voters. It takes a candidate who is willing to trust herself to take on the challenge to run. Tonight, we will ask the question, are you that candidate? And if not you, do you know who she is? Is it your daughter, your sister, your mother, your neighbor, your friend? We are looking for the avatars of tonight's three superstars and asking the question, what does it take to win? Who better to tell us than the women who did just that? JDWS was founded in 2012 with the goal of encouraging, of encouraging Jewish women to step up to become difference makers in our state. We believed in the Talmudic teaching that silence is assent and we could be silent no more. Our goal was to rally Jewish women and women at large to become advocates for the best interests of Georgians. There is simply no better way to do that than to consider taking on the challenge of elected office. And with that, I'm going to turn tonight's program over to Melita Easters to facilitate our discussion and guide us through the secrets of what it takes, not just to run, but to win. Melita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. And thank you to all the members of JDWS for asking me to participate in this program. Tonight's panelists will review Georgia's current political landscape and how it is shaping up for 2022, what it takes to run for office and alternatives for public service. By the way, for our Georgia audience, the language in some questions may seem to cover topics you are familiar with, but we are setting the context for those joining us from out of state. We began with Senator Jen Jordan, an attorney representing SD6, which includes portions of Cobb and North Fulton counties in the Northern Arc Metro Atlanta suburbs. For more than two decades, these neighborhoods were thought of as Ruby Red Republican. Senator Jordan's 2017 special election victory flipped a seat in removing the Georgia GOP's Senate majority. This win for Jen foreshadowed the defeat of more than a dozen other suburban Republican incumbents in 2018. Senator Jordan, when you announced plans to run for Georgia Attorney General in mid-April, you cited the power of possibility, which inspired the name for tonight's program. What gives you hope for this election cycle? Jen, we're having connection difficulties with you. We can't hear you. Oh, 
I'll try to call her. Well, um, why don't we, why don't we skip on down to um, the next person? The first one um, here, 2017. Oh no. Okay, Jen. I'm gonna. Okay. Go ahead, Jen. No, no, no. Can you hear me or not? Okay. All right. So, sorry, y'all. With respect to, to 2017, I, I kind of want to talk about what started all of that. Um, after November of 2016, I think every probably person um, on this Zoom was pretty devastated. And so what I started to do is um, I really started to recruit other women to run, um, in part because I lived in a Republican district, so it didn't seem to make sense for me. Um, but a few months after Trump won, I lost a case in the Georgia Supreme Court dealing with an 18-year-old who was sexually assaulted. And I'm not going to go into the details, but we eventually lost that case. And, um, and, and I remember thinking when I was arguing it in front of just all men that they had no clue what this young woman had gone through and exactly um, how she had suffered and how it affected them. And so at that point, I decided it wasn't enough anymore just to be a good lawyer or to do the right thing, um, that we actually had to start kind of stepping up. And if I was going to preach to other women that they needed to run, then I kind of needed to, to, to live by that. Um, so I decided to run for state senate. And people told me I was crazy. They said it was drawn to be a 58, 59% performing Republican district. It had been held by Hunter Hill, who was known as a very conservative Republican. And, um, and you know what? I just said, whatever. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. It's like people have not had a choice. Um, we aren't talking about the issues that we all care about. Um, gun safety, you know, women, children, families, all the things that we care about, nobody was talking about and nobody seemed to be pushing. And I really felt kind of in my gut that if we started talking about that, um, and showing people what we would do if we were elected, that we could win. And, um, and we did. And we were the, the very first flip. And I like to say that we were the canary in the coal mine because I think it really was indicative of, of something bigger happening here. Um, and I think it's only continued. And so when I think about 22, that's why I'm excited because every cycle, we're adding a little bit more, we're doing a little bit more, um, and we're winning more, right? That's what we're doing, we're winning more. And so when I talk about the power of possibility too, I mean, all you have to do is look at Senator Warnock or Senator Ossoff, see what we've, they've already been able to achieve just because we elected Democrats. I mean, it has a real impact on people's lives. So now we know we can do it, and now we just need to do it again in 22, um, and we need to do it better, and we need to have women running up and down the ticket. I just really believe that that is actually, uh, that's actually the way to win. Thank you so much. I want to note we have time set aside to ask our panelists viewer submitted questions. Please submit your questions via the Zoom chat feature or as a Facebook Live comment. The first question comes to Senator Jordan from her fellow attorney, Libby Gazansky. She asked why now is the right time for you to run for attorney general and how you will approach this important job. So I've been a uh, practicing attorney for, for about 20 years and I do trial work. And really what I do is I stand up for individuals against powerful interests. That's what I've done my entire career. Um, I think after what we've seen through the Trump years in terms of um, kind of tearing down institutions and also going after people's constitutional rights. I mean, we've seen it here in Georgia with the heartbeat bill in terms of um, choice. We've seen it with the right to vote after SB 202. I mean, it, it's like there is an assault every single day on just our basic rights. And so in terms of the attorney general in the state of Georgia, that person is supposed to be the people's lawyer, the, the people of Georgia's lawyer. And so the way that I look at it is, it is now more important than ever that we actually have somebody who can stand up and fight and actually try to protect the people um, 
versus just kind of going along and getting along um, in terms of some kind of partisan way with respect to um, the Republican governor or the, the president or whatever. So I think, I think right now we need somebody who's willing to kind of stand in the breach and actually stand up for the people. So I think that's why it's more important. And I think specifically with respect to why is 22 the time, it's because demographically we've changed. Um, we've had the money put into the infrastructure and Georgia's hot right now. Um, I've had more national groups reach out to me, national donors reach out. Um, Y'all, we used to couldn't get anybody to pay attention to this state. And now it is like we are we are first on the list. And so it has to happen. It's going to happen. And 22 is the time for it to happen. And um, you know what? I think I'm the right person and I think it's the right time. Thank you so much. And you are the right person and it is the right time. Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark is an epidemiologist and nursing professor who flipped a Gwinnett County House seat in 2018 as part of the wave which turned three Metro Atlanta legislative delegations blue for the first time in decades. You ran after chairing an Atlanta Science March in 2017. Tell us why 2018 was a good time for you to run and update us on the continuing wins for Gwinnett Democrats in 2020. What made these campaigns successful? Uh, first, thank you to everyone for um, the invitation to speak tonight. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, so, uh, you know, I ran in 2018 on a platform of bringing a science voice to Georgia. And I can honestly say that um, even when I was running, uh, you know, I, I hoped that my science voice would be helpful. I hope that it would it would, um, I would uh, be, you know, add a value to the Georgia State Legislature. That was the reason why I ran in the first place. Um, and so, you know, when I got uh, elected in 2018, I definitely, um, you know, felt like I needed to find my niche, you know, find how exactly does that science voice fit and what was really pretty much, um, you know, the good old boys club. Um, and uh, most of the people there did not have a science background. Um, so, you know, when I ran in 2018, it really was a response, if I'm being completely honest, it was a response to Trump. And it was a response to Trump's anti intellectualism, anti, you know, um, anti science, uh, anti facts, honestly, if we're being if we're being really honest, he just was like an enemy to facts, data, science, you know, all of the things that um, are really important when you're making decisions. And so, you know, after, you know, really talking with my friends, um, talk, not just my friends, talking with my family about it, as well as my friends, I decided to go ahead and put myself out there and decided to run for office. Um, and, you know, when you run for something um, as more of a non-traditional candidate, and especially when you win, there's always this little voice in your head that says, you know, did I make the right decision? Do I belong? Um, and I very quickly figured out with the heartbeat bill that I definitely had a place in that place. They needed to hear from me. They needed someone that was going to call them out for um, their, their lies, because that's what they were doing. They were literally lying and no one was calling them out not because they didn't, you know, they wanted them to get away with the lies, but a lot of the lies were so insidious um, that uh, people didn't realize what they were, but the way I was trained um, in the sciences, the way I read papers, the way I read through things, I caught a couple of those lies. Um, and so after that, that was kind of a defining moment to me where I realized I was not the oddball out, I was more of a missing link. And so that's why I was really excited when in 2020, even more people with STEM backgrounds decided to run for office. Yes, we need that. We need those science voices. I don't want to be the only one. And now I have um, Rebecca Mitchell and I also have Michelle Al there. So, you know, now we're getting more and more of those STEM voices, those science voices in the room. Diversity of thought and diversity of background and diversity of perspectives is a good thing. 
in a healthy legislature because it just offers more perspectives. And so that's why I'm um, really glad that more people are deciding to run. And, you know, if anyone here on this call is thinking about it and you're thinking, well, I don't really know if I could contribute because, you know, I'm not a lawyer or I'm not, you know, there is a place for lawyers. We definitely need our lawyers. I lean on the lawyers in the legislature all the time, but there is also a place for other different types of mindsets and thought processes. And so women should not feel like they don't belong. You know, just grab your seat, pull it up to the table because your voice is important. Thank you. Now to Representative Shay Roberts. The maps demonstrating the shift of Romney 2012 votes to Biden 2020 votes in your district have become a social media sensation because of the very dramatic flip from pink and red to shades of blue. When you ran in 2018, you nearly defeated an incumbent Republican. Thankfully, you kept on campaigning and won in 2020. What encouraged you to run initially and to persist following the 2018 loss for your win in 2020? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Melita. Um, well, like many of us, you know, I woke up in November, 2016 and I was horrified at who our country had elected. And for months, I was traumatized by the news. Sometime in January 2018, my best friend from law school forwarded a post where advocacy groups were recruiting for my district and, because Trump had only gotten 48% of the vote in 2016. So we knew it was purple. And she said, you know, that's your district. You could run. And I literally remember laughing out loud. But she planted that seed in the back of my head and then Probably a couple of weeks later, my daughter came home from middle school describing to me for the first time an active shooter drill at her school, having to climb on a shelf in the instrument closet in her music room. And she just said, it, I sat in the dark forever, mom. And I felt nauseous listening to her. And then not two weeks later, I found myself crying on the sofa, watching the events of Parkland, the Parkland shooting unfold. And of course, um, I know we were all horrified and heartbroken, but I was also really mad because I realized that it had been almost four years since we saw babies being killed at Sandy Hook and not a damn thing had changed. And I decided right then that screaming at my TV was no longer enough. And I announced my candidacy early uh, March. I was the first Democrat to run in my district since 2004. And while I wasn't unfamiliar with politics because I'm a zoning attorney by trade, so I essentially lobby for neighborhood groups, small builders, developers, but at the local level, I was a very green candidate. Both of my colleagues on this panel know that. Um, and I jumped in with both feet, hired staff and got to work. And we did work we did. We knocked doors six days a week from June until election day. And I should tell you, my opponent grew up in Sandy Springs, went to our local high school, raised her kids there, so, and was beloved in the community. So she added a whole extra level of difficulty to trying to beat an incumbent in a purple district. Um, we came up short by about 1,200 votes, which of course was disappointing. Um, I wasn't sure whether I would run again, but I spent a lot of time um, down at the 2019 session, specifically watching two major bills, the one where we adopted our new voting machines, and that's where my passion for election issues uh, really started and has continued, um, and then also the anti-abortion bill. And I will tell you, I was, I know the, all the women on this call remember that really dark day. And I knew right then that I would take my last breath fighting to make sure that um, my daughters never had to worry about politicians being in their doctor's appointments. And um, I also thought about it as a teaching moment for my kids because they had watched me work really hard the first time. And then they watched me fail. And so I felt like this was an opportunity to show them what it's like 
to pick yourself back up again and fight harder. And I just prayed the outcome would be positive. And luckily it was, I won by 377 votes in 2020. And I am so incredibly honored to serve my community. Um, I, I will uh, let y'all know, some of you know about this. Um, my opponent uh, is not going down without a continued fight. Um, since the election was certified in late November, she has been participating with the Trump Stop the Steelers. Um, they have filed suit in a Superior Court contesting my election. And um, the lawyers that are involved are all the usual suspects that you've read about in the paper. And um, the claims are baseless, just like the other lawsuits that were dismissed. And luckily the judge agreed and dismissed the case on April 22nd. Um, I hope that would be the end of it, but they have now filed an appeal to the Georgia Supreme Court last this past Friday. I have every confidence in my legal team and know this case is gonna be behind us soon. Um, I haven't been very public about it prior to now because I wanted to focus on doing my job at my first session. Um, and so just know that I'm not gonna stop fighting this assault, frankly, on our democracy because we deserve the leaders we chose. Um, and if you want more information about the suit, um, I'm happy to put my contact information in the chat. Um, so feel free to reach out anytime, but I'm going to keep fighting the fight. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you fighting that fight, and we know that you know how to persist. So we wish you well in the lawsuit. Thank you. Senator Jordan was part of the inaugural WED Leadership Academy class in 2012. The class also included Congresswoman Nakima Williams, who is now chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia and president of her congressional freshman class. Senator Jordan, tell us about the various training programs you participated in to prepare for your state Senate campaign. And then also, you ran five years after that WLA class. What factors led you to determine it was time to run and helped you decide the Senate was where you wanted to serve? So it's interesting because um, I think that WinList was really the only group on the ground um, actually doing trainings at the time. I mean, you could do national stuff in terms of Emily's list or whatever, uh, but when y'all did the WLA at first, y'all were basically the only game in town. And part of it was because that A, people weren't running as Democrats because there really weren't opportunities to run as Democrats. And then also women. Women really women have a real issue in terms of saying, I'm gonna step up and I'm gonna run, or at least they used to. After 2016, things kind of changed a little bit. Um, so, but some of the things, the reason there was a gap is because of children and career and life. And, um, and the reality is we all have to deal with that. Like we're moms, we're, you know, when you have little kids, you have to make a determination if it makes sense for you to go run for office where you have to be out every night um, knocking on doors or whatever you're doing. And, um, and we're at different places in our careers too. And so people like to say, you know, women can have it all and they can, but sometimes they can't have it all at the same time. And it's one of the things that when women um, decide to run, they really have to do it in full partnership with their families. Um, because it does, it impacts every single person in the household. And it's hard. It is super hard. It's hard to kind of, you know, people yell at you, people, you know, say ugly things about you on social media. They do all this stuff. And um, it's, it's one of those things that when you come home at night, you have to know kind of like you're coming home and you're coming home to people that support you. So um, I think women have a very different thought process when it comes to running. But now there are tons of tons of trainings and now because of zoom and, and the like um, women have access to to any number of groups Emily's list emerge I mean y'all are still doing WLA I mean if you want to know how to do something or how to learn how to campaign um, there is a group that you can plug into to teach you that and and you know there it's really important almost to have kind of that sisterhood too because sometimes you just want to call somebody up and say is this right? Like this doesn't feel right. This doesn't um, look right. Or what are you doing here? Or how are you raising money? Or are you knocking doors? Um, or can you just tell me somebody to hire? It, it's that kind of real nuts and bolts stuff that you just you really do need 
um, kind of your friends, you know, um, Shay, Jasmine, they know this, like we all talk to each other probably um, a lot more than we talk to anybody else. And, and really women do support each other and women electeds and candidates really do try to lift each other up. And, um, and that's why it, it is a very special kind of relationship too, because man, we are, we're in it together. I'll tell you that much. So, but yeah, there's tons of things people can do if they're interested. Well, thank you so much. And, and that is one of the most gratifying things about WinList is seeing how the Win Sisterhood has nurtured those coming along. Representative Clark, how did you prepare to run for office and what factors governed your decision? And then of equal importance, how did you to begin to build your campaign team after you decided to run? So uh, preparing to run for office for me probably looks different than it did for some others. And that my decision to run for office um, uh, was uh, very quick. Um, I pretty much, I ran the Atlanta March for Science. And then after I ran the Atlanta March for Science, I uh, joined the Georgia Alliance for Social Justice. And I was really in activism spaces. And it really wasn't until um, there was a spreadsheet going around that showed all the uncontested races in, in Georgia. And I realized that my um, state seat was being uncontested um, and that it was a very flippable seat. And, you know, this is that moment of reckoning where you're like, I feel like this is a sign. I've been doing these things. I've been in this. And now I feel like something is calling on me to run. Um, and so um, preparing to run for office for me, I kind of put my name on the ballot first and then did trainings and, you know, then really reached out to others who had run for office. I reached out to my county party for support. I reached out to the Democratic Party for support, just, you know, trying to get guidance on what to do, how to do it. Um, there were elected officials like uh, Renita Shannon and others, uh, Brenda, Brenda Lopez Romero, um, and, you know, a few others that uh, sat down and met with me um, to talk me through, you know, their experiences campaigning. And so I probably went about this uh, definitely um, in a, uh, a, a manner that was, you know, not as easy <laughs> as it uh, could have been. Um, but I learned a lot along the way. I met a lot of awesome people. And, you know, I, um, I feel like I have really had the opportunity um, to, to, to they do this from the ground up. Um, one thing I can say, and um, Senator Jordan brought this up, and it's, it's so true, your family is so involved in this process. And so, you know, I was running for office um, as a single mom. I have a daughter. She's 12 now, but at the time that I was running, she was, she was uh, 10. Um, so young daughter, and pretty much every event that I went to, every canvassing that I did, my daughter was right there with me. Um, you know, every now and then she would throw on a blazer and grab a clipboard and she would ask people if they want to volunteer for her mom. You know, she uh, was the kind of person that would say, if people say, oh, well, I don't live um, in your mom's district, she would say, that's okay, you can still donate or you don't have to live in the district to make phone calls. Like she was on it. So I realized that, you know, she's watching me and she's paying attention to me. And as you all can see, I do apologize for my very unprofessional background, but my car is literally my second office because now I'm pretty much following her around everywhere she goes because she has a super busy life where um, I am uh, sitting in the car waiting for her to be done with track practice. Um, but, you know, I, I think when it comes to uh, campaigning, it's a, it's a process that's going to involve your entire family, um, you know, whether you want it to or not, because, you know, if you're used to cooking all the time, hey, get used to going to receptions, and then gotta, you got to figure out dinner for the family, you know, things like that, especially when it was just me and my daughter. Um, as far as building my campaign team, um, again, that was another thing that I kind of did from scratch, and I really leaned on others to give me referrals um, for people. But I also had people in my community that just said, 
I want to be a part of your team because I have been waiting for a Democrat to step up and, and run. And I think that you're awesome and I want to help you win. And so, uh, you know, a mixture of referrals and then just people who asked, you know, how can I help you um, really helped me to build my campaign team in 2018. And then in 2020, um, you know, the same thing, except I had a lot more people. Once you win, it definitely becomes a lot easier for people to want to join your team. And so then I was more making choices at that point. Um, so, you know, um, running for office, uh, you know, I, it was the right time. And, um, you know, I, I probably should have done Winless Academy, <laughs> but uh, in the end, I am still glad that I did it, um, even if I kind of took a, you know, a different path than some others. Thank you. We're glad you did it too. Um, <laughs> Representative Roberts, what might you add regarding training and the factors to consider when deciding whether to run? And then let's also have you share what it is like to run a campaign and flip a seat. Did I, okay, did I mute this time? Um, <laughs> so um, as far as adding about training, I kind of was in the same boat as um, Jasmine in that I jumped in very last minute and was very green and the timing was kind of off for win list. I was just trying to get my feet underneath me and, um, you know, find staff and figure out what I was doing. And I think I'd missed the deadline. And so my first round, I didn't do any training. Um, and then my second round, I actually um, got encouraged by um someone in, in the community to do one of the DLCC trainings and I traveled to Florida. So I would definitely recommend to anyone thinking about running. Um, there are so many resources out there, but Winless is fantastic. Go to one or more trainings because I really do think they help. They help you figure out how to, you know, do your stump speech and um, give you information on what you need to do on social media and just messaging, fundraising, all kinds of things that if you're new to this or you haven't worked on a campaign, it can seem kind of like a foreign language. Um, and so I, I would highly recommend that. And then as to um, my campaign, um, you know, running a campaign varies depending on whether you're running in an already democratic district versus me running in, in and Jasmine and Jen running in a purple district and trying to flip a seat. But I will say one universal thing that is required of any district um, is knocking doors and talking to voters. That was my favorite part. I love knocking doors. Um, and so in 2018, like I said, we were knocking six days a week, couple hours on the weeknights and typically three to four hours on Saturdays. Obviously in 2020, COVID forced us to the phone, so it was a little different, but contact with voters is the number one thing uh, uh, that you can do in winning local and state ledge races. Um, specifically, to, I mean, fundraising is important to all campaigns, but to flip a seat, that is probably equally or more important than <laughs> knocking doors. And I will tell you that making fundraising calls was one of the hardest things for me. Um, I had less time in 2018, but I raised about $75,000 in my district. That was not enough. In fact, uh, my good friend and uh, Senator Jen, fellow panelist here, had me over for wine after the 2019 session when I told her I was going to give it another shot. And she, she was very direct and she said, don't bother unless you're going to raise at least $200,000. Um, and so I thought long and hard about it and just decided that I needed to change my mindset about fundraising to treat it like a business. Um, you know, I was blessed to be able to have a couple of volunteer call time managers, one of which is on this call, who is uh, Leslie Mullis. She is super uber and awesome uh, volunteer. Um, and so she would take notes while I was on the calls. She would be my cheerleader. She would encourage me and she would hold me accountable, which is the big one. And so um, I actually broke records in fundraising. I raised $320,000 in 2020, um, which allowed me to match my opponent mailer for mailer. Um, I think I might've sent more. I sent eight. Um, 
Same with digital ads. And in my district, TV is extremely expensive and I was even able to match her with TV ads. Um, so not all districts require that level of fundraising, um, but that was what it took to flip my seat um, and so and get over that finish line that we had worked so hard for. So those are the two key things is talking to voters and fundraising are, are really the two most important things. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Senator Jordan, what are the differences between running for a House seat and a Senate seat? And because you're running statewide now, your Senate seat becomes an open seat. And why are open seats such an attractive opportunity for a campaign? So in terms of the House and the Senate, really, it's actually harder to run for a Senate seat. Um, and there's no upside to it. So every a House member or a Senate member, we have to run every two years. We get paid the same thing. The only difference is I represent 200,000 people, Shea represents 50,000. So you can imagine when you're campaigning and you're talking about kind of the per voter cost in terms of the money you have to raise um, to actually communicate to voters, it is way higher um, in, in, kind of in a Senate seat. And so I think every one of my races, I raised and spent 400 to $500,000. Um, which was really unheard of previously, especially for Democrats. Um, but that is the way you win. I mean, you have to raise the money because if you don't have the money, you can't message. You can be the best candidate in the world. You can be amazing, the smartest, the best. But if you can't get to the voters and communicate that, it doesn't matter. It's like a tree falling in the wood. So fundraising is super hard. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it every single day but it is the only way that you can actually get to the point where you can talk to voters effectively. And the bigger the district, which now if it's a statewide, obviously then exponentially, it, it pushes up kind of the money needed to be able to effectively communicate. So why is it good for open seats? It's because an incumbent has name ID, they've run before, they have fundraising connections. So they already kind of have a kind of a campaign in a box that they can kind of pop open, right? They've got a record, all of this stuff. Um, so when you're a challenger, you have to push against that, which then also makes it more expensive and harder. I mean, Shay worked her butt off um, for the last few years. And so and because of that, she won, right? But it wasn't easy at all. I mean, knocking off an incumbent is really hard. That's why open seats are something that people really eye because Nobody comes in with the benefits of incumbency, the benefits of name recognition. And in terms of redistricting, anybody who's looking at running in my seat, and I hope all of you are looking at it, everybody needs to keep their head down until the lines are drawn. Um, because if you're a super good candidate and you're like, look at me, I'm gonna run, I'm a super good candidate, I'm a Democrat. Um, the Senator Kowser is gonna come in and he's gonna draw you out of the district. So we have to be very strategic about how we go about recruiting for this. Um, I don't know what my district's going to look like. I don't know who's going to be in it and who's not. If you're interested, come to me and let's start talking about kind of building the apparatus. But let's kind of do it all on the download because we don't want to give Republicans the benefit of being able to cut people out of the process before it even starts. Very, very true. And that is the same advice we are giving others for open seats because we don't want to let them know who's going to pop up to run for these seats. I want it to be like a whack-a-mole game. They just won't know where our good women are going to pop up to run from. Let's shift the topic just a bit based on an inquiry from Alice Wortham. There are many ways to serve your community on the local level, and we're running a little bit behind. So Representative Roberts, could you tell us about some of these opportunities for local elected service and especially what's going on in Sandy Springs this November? Oh my goodness, there are so many opportunities for folks to run and serve our communities, and we need good qualified candidates particularly women, please, in every single race. I mean, y'all, Georgia is the largest state east of the Mississippi. It's now the eighth most populous state in the nation with 10.7 million people. Um, we've got 159 counties, 538 cities and towns, and that means 
thousands of municipal posts, 3,830 3, county commission seats, school board seats, sheriff's tax commissioners, and guess what? Roughly half of the municipal contests are on the ballot this November. Um, and I know I've personally been looking for great candidates in my city who I would like to collaborate with. One of them is on the call and my super uber volunteer Leslie Mullis has already announced. I'm so excited. So y'all give her lots of support because she's amazing. Um, but if you know, if you're aspiring for higher office, city council races are a great place as a great stepping stone. Terry Nullowitz served 10 years on Smyrna City Council and um, was mayor pro tem and now and then she ran unopposed in one of those open seats in 2017 which doesn't happen as often these days but um so so this is a great place to start right and um in sandy springs in particular um we elect our mayor and all six council members this fall qualifying is august 16th to the 20th uh, but like i said some candidates are already beginning to announce which is awesome um and really for so long, we haven't had many contested races. In 2017, we had one contested seat. Tibby DiGiulio has been in his seat since the city was incorporated in 2005. And in 2013, when there were contests for mayor and five of the city council seats, fewer than 10,000 people voted, believe me. Me and my progressive Sandy Springs folks like Mary Barron on the call and all of us are not going to let that happen again. We know that people vote in greater numbers when they feel they have a choice in the process. Competition energizes voters and we are working hard to have challengers in every seat so that our community has good options. Um, if you're in other North Fulton cities with elections this fall, Alpharetta has three council member uh, seats and Johns Creek has a mayor's race and three council members on the ballot as well. So please, 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 we want lots of good female, preferably candidates running in these seats. Well, when women run, women win. It's true. Uh, and, and women in numbers vote for women. Representative Clark, if you could briefly mention any of the municipal elections in Gwinnett County this fall, but also could you please address the non-elected boards and commissions briefly, which are crucial to the smooth operation of local government. And in particular, um, Syra Draper asked about the importance of county election boards. Absolutely. So um, like in uh, most of Georgia, there are going to be some municipal elections. Uh, there will be mayor, uh, mayoral elections and uh, in some of our cities and city council elections in all of our cities. So um, we have uh, 16 cities in Gwinnett County. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities in Gwinnett to put your name on a ballot at the city level. And I always say the city level is probably one of the most important levels because it's the one that directly impacts um, your day-to-day -day life. And so these are really important uh, roles. Um, but when it comes to non-elected positions, there are also lots of different boards and committees and authorities um, that people can uh, petition to be on as well. Um, a lot of these boards and authorities and things like that, they're appointed. So you don't have to go through an election process, but usually it does involve kind of like a letter writing campaign uh, to whoever is doing the appointing. Um, they're actually state level appointed boards. Um, uh, there are and, and then there are local appointed boards. So in Gwinnett County, we have several of these boards, uh, Citizens Advisory Board, um, the um, uh, Airport Authority, we have lots of different boards. So, you know, go to your county website um, or your city website and see what opportunities there might be for you to get on some of these boards. Because these positions are important. They are, they're making important decisions as well. And a lot of people don't even know that they exist. And so that is something um, that we need to make sure that we have uh, progressive voices um, and Democrats on these boards as well. Uh, when it comes to elections boards, um, we've seen quite a bit of uh, upheaval uh, in the legislature surrounding elections boards, but the elections boards are 
very important. If the last election is any indication, we really have to be vigilant about who's on these boards and what these boards are doing. Um, most of the boards in um, at least in the metro area are bipartisan boards. They're gonna have um, both Democrats and Republicans on the board. Uh, a lot of times these are appointed by the different county parties. And then there's usually a fifth member who is either going to be appointed by someone in the local governing authority in Gwinnett County, that fifth person is actually selected by the other four members. Um, we have there's different ways. Each each county election board is set up a little bit different, um, but they are making some very important decisions. These boards vote on things like um, election schedules, uh, early voting schedules. They actually vote on which provisional ballots get accepted and which ones don't. Um, you know, they are um, they're making very, very important decisions. And so if you have the opportunity, reach out to your county party and ask them how you can be involved or be considered to get on an election board if that is possible. Um, and then also, even if you can't be on the board, I, it's really important to actually get the schedule and attend those meetings. They take public comment and it's good to just know what they are doing, know where the money is being spent, you know, know uh, how the people on the board is voting because um, the next election, if you think this last election was something, the next election is not going to be any better. It's probably going to be worse. And now with SB 202 signed into law, um, we have to be very, very like hyper vigilant about what's going on at our local uh, county election boards. So um, that's a, a great question, Sarah, because it's, it really is something um, that we need to pay attention to. Thank you. We're gonna begin to wind down tonight's discussion by asking each of our panelists to share the best piece of advice they received about either running for office or serving as an elected official. We'll begin with Representative Roberts. So I can be quick uh, for both of those. Uh, running, I think the best thing somebody told me was to be genuine uh, because you know, right now in this climate of no public trust, the best thing that you can do is be yourself and be genuine and people will react to that and they will trust you right off the bat. Uh, elected, I was told to do a lot of listening. And I think that's really, really key, especially your first session, um, because it, there's a lot to learn. And if you're talking too much and not listening, that doesn't work so good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Representative Clark, your response to the same question. Um, I would say some of the best advice I got was to not try to uh, dim my light in order to make people comfortable. Um, when I first decided to run for office, I didn't even tell people I had a PhD because I was too afraid that I would come off as elitist. Um, and very quickly, people were like, stop doing that. Stop trying to, you know, um, to, to make yourself small. Um, you know, be who you are, as Shay said. And as an elected official, um, some of the best advice I've, I've gotten is to be consistent and be persistent. It's very likely you will not get a whole bunch of wins all at once in the very beginning. You're going to have to keep at it and you're going to have to keep going. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes some bills get reintroduced multiple times before they even first get a hearing. So don't get discouraged because your bill didn't get a hearing. Just keep at it. Keep pushing. If you're doing the right thing, eventually uh, someone will pick it up. And then if we get the right people in office, it definitely will get picked up. Thank you. Now, before we give Senator Jordan the last word to close out this part of the program, I want to thank all three of you, both for your participation tonight and your selfless public service year round. I hope viewers have found the program interesting. Please do think about running for office and consider this a formal ask. Feel free to call me if you have questions about running for office. I love working to help women find their best path for fall for public service. It's great to work with these three outstanding women and the other 42 legislators who currently serve as WinList endorsed women. Now, Senator Jordan, please close out this portion of the program by sharing the best advice you received about running for office and public service. So I think it's the same. Um, I think for me, it's been, you've got to push through the fear and you have to be brave. 
Um, and it's hard. Listen, I've, I've been in the, the courtroom for years and I thought, you know, I thought I had misogyny down, like, right. When I walked into that, um, that Senate chamber, it almost like knocked me out. <laughs> I was like, whoa, is this 1950? Um, it's been hard. But every year when we get more women elected, Shay and Jasmine, every year we add another woman, things are changing just a little bit, right? And so I think that that's why this program is so important. Every single woman on this, this Zoom could run for office and probably should. And it's one of those things you always say, no, not me. And, and you get kind of, I mean, you get afraid and you think I can't do it or what if I lose? And it's like, you know what? You're never going to win if you don't put yourself out there. So look, when women run, they win. Um, and when they win, they govern differently. They're more effective. They listen to their constituents. They work harder. And so that's why it's, it's not just that I want Democrats to get elected. I want Democratic women. I want there, we're almost at a point where every senator in our caucus, Democratic caucus in the Senate could be a woman. It could be an all woman caucus. I mean, that is how we're kind of growing our numbers. So every person on here, think about it. I mean, it is, it's hard, but it'll be the best thing you've ever done. And listen, we need you. Thank you, Jen. Um, and, and thank you to our wonderful legislators for inspiring us in too many ways to count. You awe me, and I, I could do this all night long. Um, and thank you to Melita for the very important role you bring to our state in training and inspiring those who inspire us. Um, and we are inspired. Thank you to our listeners for joining us this evening. Baratunde Thurston has suggested that today's times require that the word citizen should no longer be considered as simply a noun. Citizen must also now be a verb. Our challenge is to citizen together, and that means that we as voters must enlarge our attention beyond our own legislative districts. We are all citizens, well actually we're not all citizens of the state of Georgia because we have many people on this call from outside of Georgia, but we're all citizens of a state. Having heard these three remarkable women, we remind you, regardless of where you live, to please consider adopting a district in need of your support, especially if your own district is securely blue. As we said earlier, it takes more than just a great candidate to flip a district. It takes concerned citizens just like you sharing the common goal of wanting to bring new and creative thinkers to the job of elected office. Our choices are simple. Either we run ourselves or we support other women who are doing that for us. The moment to decide which of those roles is a better fit for us is right now. Thank you again to everyone for sharing your evening with us. I think we did the impossible. We finished on time, even though we started late. Goodbye, everyone.